Welcome back, everyone, to the second and final part of this close reading of David Graeber's What's the Point If We Can't Have Fun? If you missed part one, you should read it, because this isn't, or watch it, because this isn't the sort of thing where you can just, like, drop in. I, I don't know, maybe you can. I, I don't want to tell you how to live your life. I just, I would advise going and watching part one, uh, especially because I'm not going to recap it for you here, because you probably just watched it. So let's get into this right here. Part two, What's the Point If We Can't Have Fun? It's not just that scientists are reluctant to set out on a path that might lead them to see play, and therefore the seeds of self-consciousness, freedom, and moral life, among animals. Many are finding it increasingly difficult to come up with justifications for ascribing any of these things even to human beings. Once you reduce all living beings to the equivalent of market actors, rational calculating machines trying to propagate their genetic code, you accept that not only the cells that make up our bodies, but whatever beings are our immediate ancestors, lacked anything even remotely like self-consciousness, freedom, or moral life, which makes it hard to understand how or why consciousness, a mind, a soul, could ever have evolved in the first place. American philosopher Daniel Dennett frames the problem quite lucidly. Take lobsters, he argues. They're just robots. Lobsters can get by with no sense of self at all. You can't ask what it's like to be a lobster. It's not like anything. They have nothing that even resembles consciousness. They're machines. But if this is so, Dennett argues, then the same must be assumed all the way up the evolutionary scale of complexity, from living cells that make up our bodies to such elaborate creatures as monkeys and elephants who, for all their apparently human-like qualities, cannot be proved to think about what they do. That is, until suddenly Dennett gets to humans, which, while they are certainly gliding around on autopilot at least 95% of the time, nonetheless do appear to have this me, this conscious self grafted on top of them that occasionally shows up to take supervisory notice, intervening to tell the system to look for a new job, quit smoking, or write an academic paper about the origins of consciousness. In Dennett's formulation, quote, Yes, we have a soul, but it's made of lots of tiny robots. Somehow, the trillions of robotic and unconscious cells that compose our bodies organize themselves into interacting systems that sustain the activities traditionally allocated to the soul, the ego, or self. But since we have already granted that simple robots are unconscious, if toasters and thermostats and telephones are unconscious, why couldn't teams of such robots do their fancier projects without having to compose me? If the immune system has a mind of its own, and the hand-eye coordination circuit that picks berries has a mind of its own, why bother making a supermind to supervise all of this? Then its own answer is not particularly convincing. He suggests we develop consciousness so we can lie, which gives us an evolutionary advantage. If so, wouldn't foxes also be conscious? But the question grows more difficult by an order of magnitude when you ask how it happens. The hard problem of consciousness, as David Chalmers calls it. How do apparently robotic cells and systems combine in such a way as to have qualitative experiences, to feel dampness, savor wine, adore cumbia but be indifferent to salsa? Some scientists are honest enough to admit they don't have the slightest idea how to account for experiences like these, and suspect they never will. Now, I have some problems with how he's framing this question, but they're better suited to the next section, what we're going to be talking about in the next section, so I'm going to hold off on them. So just to summarize, he's basically saying, you know, if humans are made up of cells that are unfeeling robots, and we evolved from monkeys that are unfeeling robots, how did we become thinking beings instead, right? Because the whole premise here is we all know humans play, but animals can't be doing something like that. They're these unfeeling robots. So how did humans become not unfeeling robots then? And that's the question we're about to dive into. Do the electrons dance? There is a way out of the dilemma, and the first step is to consider that our starting point could be wrong. Reconsider the lobster. Lobsters have a very bad reputation among philosophers, who frequently hold them out as examples of purely unthinking, unfeeling creatures. Presumably, this is because lobsters are the only animals most philosophers have ever killed with their own two hands before eating. 
It's unpleasant to throw a struggling creature in a pot of boiling water. One needs to be able to tell oneself that the lobster isn't really feeling it. The only exception to this pattern appears to be, for some reason, France, where Gérard de Nerval used to walk a pet lobster on a leash, and where Jean-Paul Sartre at one point became erotically obsessed with lobsters after taking too much mescaline. But, in fact, scientific observation has revealed that even lobsters engage in some forms of play, manipulating objects, for instance, possibly just for the pleasure of doing so. If that is the case, to call such creatures robots would be to shear the word robot of its meaning. Machines don't just fool around, but if living creatures are not robots after all, many of these apparently thorny questions instantly dissolve away. What would happen if we proceeded from the reverse perspective and agreed to treat play not as some peculiar anomaly, but as our starting point? A principle already present not just in lobsters and indeed all living creatures, but also on every level where we find what physicists, chemists, and biologists refer to as self-organizing systems. This is not nearly as crazy as it might sound. Philosophers of science, faced with the puzzle of how life might emerge from dead matter or how conscious beings might evolve from microbes, have developed two types of explanations. Okay, here it comes. The first consists of what's called emergentism. The argument here is that once a certain level of complexity is reached, there's a kind of qualitative leap where completely new sorts of physical laws can emerge, ones that are premised on, but cannot be reduced to, what came before. In this way, the laws of chemistry can be said to be emergent from physics. The laws of chemistry presuppose the laws of physics, but can't simply be reduced to them. In the same way, the laws of biology emerge from chemistry. One obviously needs to understand the chemical components of a fish to understand how it swims, but chemical components will never provide a full explanation. In the same way, the human mind can be said to be emergent from the cells that make it up. Those who hold the second position, usually called panpsychism or panexperientialism, agree that all this may be true, but argue that emergence is not enough. As British philosopher Galen Strawson recently put it, to imagine that one can travel from insensate matter to a being capable of discussing the existence of insensate matter in a mere two jumps is simply to make emergence do too much work. Something has to be there already, on every level of material existence, even that of subatomic particles. Something, however minimal and embryonic, that does some of the things we are used to thinking of life, and even mind, as doing, in order for that something to be organized on more and more complex levels to eventually produce self-conscious beings. That something might be very minimal indeed, some very rudimentary sense of responsiveness to one's environment, something like anticipation, something like memory. However rudimentary, it would have to exist for self-organizing systems like atoms or molecules to self-organize in the first place. Okay, I am a panpsychist, and I just want to take a moment to stand up for panpsychism here. Although, maybe it's more accurate to say that I'm like a non-psychist, because I don't think human consciousness is all that special. Uh, and it's been a deeply held belief of mine for like, it's, uh, 10 years now, I think. And it's kind of rooted in this Buddhist idea of the five aggregates, or the five skandhas would be uh, the Sanskrit, I think word for it, but not really, so I'm not going to like dive deep into the five skandhas here, but Google that and look into it a little bit if you want to look, you know, learn a little more, because it's really interesting. But basically, through like a lot of meditation and just like observing my own thinking and experience of, of life, I feel like I've been able to break down the like subjective experience of consciousness into very understandable parts that like don't require any of this magic he's talking about. It, to me, it's just that like you have your senses, right? And all of them, not just the five that we normally talk about. There's a whole bunch more. That's another thing you could Google if you want, if you're, look, if you're curious. But you have all of these senses and they sort of, you know, filter in to, to trigger like reactions in your neurons that are, are stored and crystallized as memory 
memories, which then get tied to words, right? And then the words are organized into language and formed into thought. And, and then we sort of have this dialectical process through which we think and through which we use our past memories to generate, you know, imaginations and simulations of different situations. Basically, what I'm trying to say is... I think you can very easily break down human consciousness into this very robotic process that's just really complicated, sure, but just this very robotic process that's exactly what he's saying it's not. And I don't want to spend too much time outlining my whole theory of consciousness, but the point I'm trying to make is that I think Graeber kind of loses the thread here by assuming that higher consciousness is something special. I mean, his point seemed to be that play makes sense because life doesn't demand pure competitive optimization. But now he's saying that it can only come out of some like higher consciousness and that machines and robots can't play. Which, I mean, I, I realize is kind of an absurd position I'm taking here that like computers can play. But I'm gonna argue that the reasons you know machines and robots can't play is because they're basically slaves with no freedom, right? And if you can imagine some sort of artificial intelligence that just has a few preferences and then is then like let loose on the world, I could see it playing. I don't think that's quite as unreasonable. And so I'm not trying to like contradict his whole thing here with this, oh, it's actually freedom that makes play possible. I'm just trying to say that, like, you know, I don't think we need some higher consciousness or some, like, magic of human consciousness to explain all this stuff he's talking about. And he's going to loop, it's not, it's not like the whole point is ruined because of it. He's going to loop back and kind of, you know, make a slightly different point. I just wanted to stand up for panpsychism a little bit and, and encourage you all to, you know, try doing the same thing and, like, meditating and looking at your thoughts and taking them apart until you can, you know, really feel like you can explain consciousness through purely mechanistic, mechanical, you know, uh, phenomena. So that I just needed to needed to get that out there. Thank you for indulging me. All sorts of questions are at stake in the debate, including the hoary problem of free will. As innumerable adolescents have pondered, often while stoned and first contemplating the mysteries of the universe, if the movements of the particles that make up our brains are already determined by natural laws, then how can we be said to have free will? The standard answer is that we have known since Heisenberg that the movements of atomic particles are not predetermined. Quantum physics can predict to which positions electrons, for instance, will tend to jump in aggregate in a given situation, but it's impossible to predict which way any particular electron will jump in any particular instance. Problem solved. Except... not really. Something's still missing. If all this means is that the particles which make up our brains jump around randomly, one would still have to imagine some immaterial metaphysical entity, like mind, that intervenes to guide the neurons in a non-random directions. But that would be circular. You'd need to already have a mind to make your brain act like a mind. If those motions are not random, in contrast, you can at least begin to think about a material explanation. And the presence of endless forms of self-organization in nature, structures maintaining themselves in equilibrium with their environments from electromagnetic fields to processes of crystallization, does give panpsychists a great deal of material to work with. True, they argue, you can insist that all these entities must either simply be obeying natural laws, laws whose existence does not itself need to be explained, or just moving completely randomly, but if you do, it's really only because you've decided that's the only way you were willing to look at it. And it leaves the fact that you have a mind capable of making such decisions an utter mystery. Granted, this approach has always been the minority position. During much of the 20th century, it was put aside completely. It's easy enough to make fun of. Like, wait, you aren't actually seriously suggesting that tables can think. And no, no one's seriously suggesting that. The argument is that those self-organizing elements that make up tables, such as atoms, evince extremely simple forms of the qualities that, on an exponentially more complex level, we consider thought. But in recent years, especially with the newfound popularity in some scientific circles of the ideas of philosophers like Charles Sanders Peirce and Alfred North Whitehead, we have begun to see something of a revival. Curiously. It's largely physicists who have proved receptive to such ideas. Also mathematicians, perhaps unsurprisingly, since Pierce and Whitehead themselves both began their careers as mathematicians. 
physicists are more playful and less hidebound creatures than, say, biologists. Partly, no doubt, because they rarely have to contend with religious fundamentalists challenging the laws of physics. They are the poets of the scientific world. If one is already willing to embrace 13-dimensional objects or an endless number of alter alternate universes, or to casually suggest that 95% of the universe is made up of dark matter and energy about whose properties we know nothing, it's perhaps not too much of a leap to also contemplate the possibility that some atomic particles have free will, or even experiences. And indeed, the existence of freedom of the subatomic level is currently a heated question of debate. Is it meaningful to say an electron chooses to jump the way it does? Obviously, there's no way to prove it. The only evidence we could have that we can't predict what it's going to do, we do have. But it's hardly decisive. Still, if one wants a consistently materialist explanation of the world, that is, if one does not wish to treat the mind as some supernatural entity imposed on the material world, but rather as simply a more complex organization of processes that are already going on at every level of material reality, then it makes sense that something at least a little like intentionality, something at least a little like experience, something at least a little like freedom, would have to exist on every level of physical reality as well. Why do most of us, then, immediately recoil at such conclusions? Why do they seem crazy and unscientific? Or, more to the point, why are we perfectly willing to ascribe agency to a strand of DNA, however metaphorically, but consider it absurd to do the same with an electron, a snowflake, or a coherent electromagnetic field? The answer, it seems, is because it's pretty much impossible to ascribe self-interest to a snowflake. If we have convinced ourselves that rational explanation of action can, can consist only of treating action as if there were some sort of self-serving calculation behind it, then by that definition, on all these levels, rational explanations can't be found. Unlike a DNA molecule, which we can at least pretend is pursuing some gangster-like project of ruthless self-aggrandizement, an electron simply does not have a material interest to pursue, not even survival. It is in no sense competing with other electrons. If an electron is acting freely, if it, as Richard Feynman is supposed to have said, does anything it likes, it can only be acting freely as an end in itself which would mean that at the very foundations of physical reality, we encounter freedom for its own sake, which also means we encounter the most rudimentary form of play. Okay, so I guess actually my freedom is the basis of play argument is pretty valid then, huh? Uh, I let him go for a while uninterrupted there because I didn't really have much to add, but let me just try to summarize what we just heard real quick. I think basically what he's saying is if the movement of atoms follows natural laws, you know, if we live in a deterministic universe where there's no such atom as like free William or something and everything is just following these laws of physics, then how can we have free will, right? Everything's going to be determined by what came before it. And, you know, let me just toss out another Buddhist concept here of conditioned genesis, which is their version of that concept and certainly worth looking up on your own. Anyways, if everything follows from, you know, the laws of physics, how can we have free will? Well, because electrons are given some degree of freedom by quantum mechanics. You know, we don't know what they're going to do, so there seems to be some element of freedom there. And we don't like to think of electrons and atoms as free because, you know, we can't perceive their self-interest. How could they be free? They don't, what, what would they do with it? They don't want anything. But Richard Feynman, who is basically Jesus, when it gets, certainly in the world of like physics and chemistry and all that, he says electrons do whatever they like, you know, which means they are free. But they're free, but they don't have any self-interest, right? Which, as we decided early on, is exactly what play is. Freedom exercised for its own sake. So if we can't predict what electrons are going to do, then they seem to be free on some level but we can't figure out any sort of self-interest for them, so they're free with no self-interest, so electrons are playing? That's where we're at right now. Let's keep going. Swim with the fishes. Let us imagine a principle. Call it a principle of freedom, or since Latinate constructions tend to carry more weight in such matters, call it a principle of ludic freedom. 
Let us imagine it to hold that the free exercise of an entity's most complex powers or capacities will, under certain circumstances at least, tend to become an end in itself. It would obviously not be the only principle active in nature. Others pull other ways. But if nothing else, it would help explain what we actually observe, such as why, despite the second law of thermodynamics, the universe seems to be getting more, rather than less, complex. Evolutionary psychologists claim they can explain, as the title of one recent book has it, why sex is fun. What they can't explain is why fun is fun. This could. This is a really cool idea to me. And the first time I read through it, it kind of didn't make any sense and it seemed a little silly. So I'm gonna take some time on it right now, forgive me. But, and also forgive me for being so obsessed with David Graeber, but it reminds me a lot of an idea from his book, Bullshit Jobs, where he talks about, you know, the, this phenomenon of people having jobs that do nothing, that they feel like are totally pointless and don't change the, you know, have any effect on the world. They're just there for some silly reason, you know, and he goes and I'm not going to explain the whole principle of bullshit jobs. Definitely read the book. One of my favorite books. Incredibly good. Buy it, read it. Uh, just, you know, become obsessed with David Graeber and, and internalize all of his thoughts as your own and, and remove your personality and just replace it with a simulacra of what you think David Graeber would do. That's my basic advice. <laughs> anyways, anyways. Um, reminds me of this idea from Bullshit Jobs that people like to see themselves having an impact on their environment. So you'd think someone who has a job where they basically just, you know, get paid to just like sit somewhere all day and do nothing, you'd think they'd be incredibly happy they're actually miserable. And one of the reasons he gives for that is that we like to see ourselves having an impact on our environment. And actually reading that and, and thinking about it was one of the main reasons I originally decided to make the Rocket Daily stream like so directly interactive. Like it was always about talking, you know, giving your opinions, but I, I read that and I was like, oh, it'd be really cool if like you could vote and like a thing would show up, right? And there'd be like all the, all the interactivity. Anyways, interesting side note there. But part of it is you see the same thing in babies, right? Where when a baby realizes it can like make a thing happen, it just does that thing over and over and over again until the parents are like, you know, go insane and, and stop it from doing the thing any longer. Um, and, you know, I, I'm almost falling into that trap of demanding that everything serve a competitive purpose, which is exactly what he's, you know, saying we shouldn't do here. We shouldn't just assume that everything has to be directed towards optimizing the organism for peak competitiveness. But it's not really about like competition and making the babies the best, right? I haven't gotten to what I'm trying to say yet, sorry. But what I'm trying to say is that a part of the way we learn to act is by enjoying having, you know, an impact on the world around us. Part of the way that we learn that we can do stuff is, you know, as a little baby, you do a thing and you say, hee, hee, that's so much fun. And that's kind of what he's talking about here, right? With this idea of ludic, freeman, fr ludic freedom is that just acting and doing the most, like, ex 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 uh, what do you say, the most co uh, complex thing most you can do is exciting and fun. And so, you know, it's not about competing. It's not that it makes you better. It's just that that's how you learn to act. We learn to act because we're psychologically rewarded for acting. And then that same principle keeps working and, and it pushes us to grow, right? We grow because we're psychologically rewarded for pushing our limits, for exercising our most complex powers and capacities. So I think it's this really cool idea, you know, and again, at first I read that and I was like, oh, that doesn't make any sense at all. What? We're just like, we enjoy just doing the most complicated thing we can. But as I've started to think about it, it's like, yeah, that does kind of make sense. That, that doing the most difficult thing we have, that pushing ourselves and pushing our limits and, and playing with our limits and all that is exciting and fun. And it's this incredible, you know, way of making us grow. So I'm not trying to say that it has to serve a purpose so much as that, you know, it serves a purpose. <laughs> I don't know, it's an interesting, I don't know if I'm falling into his trap or not here, but I think it's a really interesting way of making sense of this point of Ludic Friedman. Ludic? I don't know why I'm trying to make it Morgan Freeman. I don't know why I keep saying, I don't, I don't know. Anyways, back to him. I don't deny that what I've presented so far is a savage simplification of very complicated issues. I'm not even saying that the position I'm suggesting here, that there is a play principle at the basis of all physical reality, 
is necessarily true. I would just insist that such a perspective is at least as plausible as the weirdly inconsistent speculations that currently pass for orthodoxy, in which a mindless robotic universe suddenly produces poets and philosophers out of nowhere. Nor, I think, does seeing play as a principle of nature necessarily mean adopting any sort of milky utopian view. The play principle can help explain why sex is fun, but it can also explain why cruelty is fun. As anyone who has watched a cat play with a mouse can attest, a lot of animal play is not particularly nice. But it gives us ground to unthink the world around us. Years ago, when I taught at Yale, I would sometimes assign a reading assignment containing a famous Taoist story. I offered an automatic A to any student who could tell me why the last line made sense, and none ever succeeded. Here's the story. Zhuangzi and Huizi were strolling on a bridge over the river Hao, when the former observes, See how the minnows dart between the rocks? Such is the happiness of fishes. You not being a fish, said Huizi, how can you possibly know what makes fish happy? And you not being I, said Zhuangzi, how can you know what, that I don't know what makes fish happy? If I not being you cannot know what you know, replied Huizi, does it not follow from that very fact that you, not being a fish, cannot know what makes a fish happy? Let us go back, said Zhuangzi, to your original question. You asked me how I knew what makes fish happy. The very fact you asked shows that you knew I knew, as I did know, from my own feelings on this bridge. Okay, if you're at all like me, you want to stop here for a second and see if you can figure out the, the last line of the story for yourself. So just to help you out a little bit, let's, let's go back and, and sort of, you know, <laughs> summarize the story. We got these two guys on a bridge, right? And they look down below the bridge. They see swimming, fishes swimming around and, and darting around. First guy says, wow, look how happy those fish are. And the second guy says, okay, well, you're not a fish, so how could you know what makes a fish happy? Then the first guy says, well, you're not me, so how do you know that I don't know what makes fish happy? Then the second guy says, if I can't know what you know, then how can you know what fishes know makes them happy, right? Uh, so then the, the money line here is, let us go back to your original question. You asked me how I knew what makes fish happy. The very fact you asked shows that you knew I knew, as I did know, from my own feelings on the bridge. Let us go back to your original question. You asked me how I knew what makes fish happy. The very fact you asked shows that you knew I knew, as I did know, from my own feelings on this bridge. Now, I, I think I remember my original interpretation was something to do with language uh, and something with the, you know, the fact that we can communicate between each other means that, you know, uh, different beings can understand each other and that we can sort of see, you know, other people's feelings. But that's not what he's going to say. So take a second, think what you think the explanation is going to be, and then let's go on. The anecdote is usually taken as a confrontation between two irreconcilable approaches to the world, the logician versus the mystic. But if that's true, then why did Zhuangzi, who wrote it down, show himself to be defeated by his logician friend? After thinking about this story for years, it struck me that this was the entire point. By all accounts, Zhuangzi and Huizi were the best of friends. They liked to spend hours arguing like this. Surely that was what Zhuangzi was really getting at. We can each understand what the other is feeling because, arguing about the fish, we are doing exactly what the fish are doing, having fun, doing something we do well for the sheer pleasure of doing it, engaging in a form of play. The very fact that you felt compelled to try to beat me in an argument and were so happy to be able to do so shows that the premise you were arguing must be false. Since if even philosophers are motivated primarily by such pleasures, by the exercise of their highest powers simply for the sake of doing so, then surely this is a principle that exists on every level of nature, which is why I could spontaneously identify it, too, in fish. So I guess what he's saying is that 
you know, things like doing what they're meant to do, right? or, you know, people, it be life enjoys exercising its most complex capabilities. Fish love, you know, swimming, darting between rocks, and logicians and mystics enjoy arguing about why fish like darting between rocks. And, you know, they like arguing with each other is the point. And so the last line, what was it? It's that uh, you asked me how I knew what makes a fish happy. The very fact you asked shows that you knew I knew, as I did know from my own feelings on the bridge. I'm going to enjoy arguing with you, you know, I, to be honest, it doesn't quite work for me. I mean, I get what he's saying that, that like, everything enjoys doing, you know, what it does well. I just still, that doesn't translate to this last line for me very well. The very fact you asked shows that you knew I knew. I mean, it's just basically saying that you were doing the same thing. I don't think it shows that you knew I knew. But the point is, what he's saying is, is you know... We like arguing, fish like swimming, that's, that's the way of the world. Um, yeah, anyways, let's wrap this baby up. Zhuangzi was right. So was June Thunderstorm. Our minds are just a part of nature. We can understand the happiness of fishes or ants or inchworms because what drives us to think and argue about such matters is ultimately exactly the same thing. Now, wasn't that fun? And there you have it. And like I said at the beginning, you know, I wanted to do this article because I remembered the title and I thought it would be a, a great argument for, you know, lighting up a little bit, moving a little bit away from this what's the most important thing to, to more like, you know, what should everyone know about? What are the good things? What are the great things out there? And it turned out not to be that. But, but what it was, actually, instead of an argument for that, it was an explanation of why this idea, this new direction, seems fun in the first place. It's because we're cooperating and we're doing things together, but that was, that was always there. And, and also because, you know, it's stretching our minds and exercising our most complex capabilities. It is this, the pure ludic freedom. Yeah, I said it right. Nice. You know, I mean, like, school sucks. And it sucks so bad that it burns into everyone this notion that there is a distinction between learning and fun, right? That there's entertainment and there's information. But, I, you know, I hope we can find our way to, like, busting that distinction, to making the learning fun and, you know, enjoying this, this free act of, of stretching our, or spreading our wings and, and using our most complex capabilities and all that jazz. So, you know... I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoy all the stuff we're going to do going forward. And I hope, you know, you find plenty of opportunities to play at doing things that, you know, uh, that excite and, and help you grow. So that's all I got for you guys today. I'll see you in the next video, whatever that's going to be and whatever it comes out. Have a great day, everybody. I'll talk to you later. Goodbye.